by refusing to eat and drink with Gentiles who don't keep all the purity laws and don't keep the food laws of Israel, he is threatening the gospel. He's not straightforward or sincere about the gospel, verse, verse 14. He's implicitly, as Paul implies by, in verses 15 and 16, he is violating the principle of justification by faith by not eating with Gentiles. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles, Paul says. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ Jesus and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Paul thinks that Peter is endangering justification by faith, not because he's teaching works righteousness or some kind of merit theology. He says he's endangering justification by faith by refusing to eat with Gentiles who confess Jesus. Table fellowship was a central concern in first century Judaism. It is arguably the central concern of the Pharisaical movement that arose sometime in the intertestamental period and was, of course, the promin a prominent enemy of Jesus during his ministry. Phariseeism is a movement about table fellowship. The Pharisees want Israel to be redeemed. They want Israel to be redeemed, and they think that Israel will be redeemed if they can become really pure. And so they erect all kinds of extra rules about purity, and they make sure that they are very, very pure. And that essentially means that they refuse to have any fellowship, either with Gentiles who are by definition impure in their book, or with Jews who are not observing the same uh, severity or intensity of purity regulations that they are. Phariseeism is a table fellowship movement. And they assume, the Pharisees assume, that the boundaries of table fellowship are the boundaries of Israel. We can accept anyone to our table, the Pharisees say, who is a true Israelite. How do you know who's a true Israelite? Well, of course he has to be circumcised. But then he also has to keep all our purity regulations. He has to be very strict about his tithing. He has to keep all the food laws. And then we can have table fellowship with him. That's the boundary of Israel. The boundary of the table is the boundary of the people of God. The boundary of the table is the boundary of those whom the Pharisees consider righteous ones. Everyone who's outside the table, outside their table fellowship, is a sinner. Paul and Peter assume exactly the same thing. They too think that the boundaries of, ta of the table are the boundaries of Israel. The boundaries of the table are the boundaries of the righteous ones. Righteous ones are accepted at the table. Sinners are not. Both Paul and Peter agree with that. But what is Peter doing? And what is Peter saying by what he's doing? He's saying by draw, withdrawing from table fellowship with Gentiles, he's saying that these Gentiles, even though they believe in Jesus, even though they confess that Jesus is Lord, these Gentiles don't belong at the same table with me. These Gentiles are not righteous ones, even though they believe in Jesus. These Gentiles are sinners and outcasts from my table. Paul says, the boundaries of Israel, the boundaries of the church are the boundaries of table fellowship. The boundaries of the table are the boundaries of the righteous ones. Everyone who's at the table is a righteous one. Everyone who's outside is a sinner. But Paul has a different idea of what constitutes a righteous one. What makes somebody righteous, Paul says, is not circumcision. It's not adherence to the food laws. It's not adherence to purity regulations. It's not ethnicity. What makes somebody a righteous one is Jesus Christ, who is the righteous one from God, who is our righteousness. And if Peter is not refusing to eat with Gentiles who confess Jesus the righteous one as their Lord, then Peter is in effect treating those Gentiles as outcasts and sinners. And he's expecting, he's, he's saying in effect that they need something else, something more than Jesus to be included in the table fellowship with him. Peter is violating, undermining the gospel, undermining the gospel and undermining justification by faith. Verse 16 also gives us another reason why Peter is enraged, why Paul rather is enraged at Peter. This is a very severe rebuke to Peter. He says, nevertheless, knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law, through, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by, the faith, by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Sounds like a very repetitive 
verse. We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by believing in Jesus. So we believed in Jesus so that we can be justified by believing in Jesus. And perhaps Peter is simply saying, uh, Paul rather, say, simply saying the same, same thing again and again in order to emphasize the point that justification comes by faith in Christ Jesus. I think in fact, Peter, uh, Paul rather, is saying something else. The phrase faith in Jesus Christ is actually faith of Jesus Christ. It's a genitive phrase and it could mean a couple of different things. It could mean the faith that we put in Jesus Christ. That's a possible meaning of that genitive. But it could also mean the faith that Jesus Christ himself exercises. Jesus' own faith, his trust in his Father. Jesus' own faithfulness in his death and in his resurrection. I think given the context of this verse and the apparent repetition, it's better to read it that way. So what do we have then? A man is not justified by what the law does or by, by keeping the law, but through the faithful work of Jesus Christ. That's what justifies us. And because of that, we believe in Jesus. We put our trust in the trustworthy Jesus. We put our faith in the faithful Jesus so that we might be justified by the faithful work of Christ. As Paul says at the end of the chapter, I don't nullify the grace of God. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. And what he implies there, of course, is that righteousness comes through the death of Jesus, through Jesus' faithfulness unto death. That's how righteousness comes into the world. This is another reason why Paul is uh, enraged at Peter. Paul sees that Peter is not only saying that these Gentiles who believe in Jesus are sinners and not righteous ones. Peter is not only treating them as outcasts, even though they believe in Jesus, but he's acting as if Jesus himself didn't bring righteousness, but instead brought sin into the world. That's what he says in verse 16. If while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? May it never be. But Peter is implying that. Peter is saying, these Gentiles believe in Jesus. They trust in Jesus for righteousness. And yet I'm going to consider them sinners. People who believe in Jesus considered sinners. That makes Jesus himself a minister or a servant of sin. He doesn't bring righteousness by his death and resurrection. He brings further sin. See, Paul sees, uh, according to Paul, Peter is not simply insulting the Gentiles. Peter is insulting Jesus Christ. Peter is saying that Jesus Christ's death did not have the effect that we claim it has. Jesus Christ's death did not bring righteousness into the world. His faithfulness did not bring righteousness to those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Peter is insulting Jesus Christ and undermining the gospel there too as well. B.B. Warfield, the great Princeton theologian, once said that the Reformation, inwardly considered, is the triumph of Augustine's doctrine of grace over Augustine's doctrine of the church. The Reformation recovered Augustine's doctrine about God's sovereign grace, the utter graciousness of salvation, but disagreed with Augustine's doctrine of the church. Let me put Augustine aside. What can we say about Paul? Can we say the Reformation recovered Paul's doctrine of grace, but not his doctrine of the church? That may be true. But if that's true, then we're splitting things that Paul keeps together. Because Paul, for Paul, his doctrine of grace is the doctrine of the church. It's precisely because justification is by grace through faith that Gentiles are to be welcomed at the Lord's table along with Jews. It's because of the nature of grace and the way grace is received. Because righteousness comes through the death of Christ, the faithful death of Christ. And that righteousness is received by faith and not by the works of the law. That's why Gentiles and Jews now sit down at the same table without any consideration of any of the Jewish ceremonies. You can't separate for Paul grace from the church. You can't separate his doctrine of justification by faith from his doctrine of the church where all of the boundaries between Jews and Gentiles have now been broken down in Christ Jesus. We can put it this way. Protestants often commemorate, as we are doing today, Reformation Day. Less frequently, Protestants celebrate and commemorate All Saints Day. You look at the front of your bulletin, you see that we're doing both. 
this is a Reformation Day slash All Saints celebration. A very Pauline celebration, I think. A very Pauline celebration because the doctrines that the Reformation recovered, the doctrine of justification by faith and not by the works of the law, is precisely a doctrine about the unity of the church, the Catholicity of the church, the breadth of the church. The church is no longer confined simply to one nation, but people from every tribe and tongue and nation are welcome at Jesus' table as Jesus' fellows. And what Paul says to Peter is, of course, still applicable today. Since the Reformation, justification by faith has been a fighting doctrine. It's been a doctrine that has divided, and many of those divisions were necessary to preserve the purity of the gospel. But in the midst of those debates and those divisions, uh, an essential part of the doctrine of justification by faith has been lost. Not, I'm not talking about Protestant Catholic divides. We don't have to even go that far. Protestants can't even get along with each other. Reformed Christians can't even get along with each other. People in the same tradition, they can't get along with each other. And often they do it in the name of the gospel. In the name of the gospel of justification by grace through faith, we have to divide from these other people and have no table fellowship with these other people who also profess Jesus Christ as Lord, Jesus Christ as the righteous one. Paul's rebuke to Peter would be the same as his, to us would be the same as his rebuke to Peter. You're not straightforward about the gospel. You're undermining justification by faith. If you refuse as a table fellow, anyone who professes Jesus Christ. Paul says at the end of Galatians 3, that in the seed of Abraham, that is in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek, no slave or free, no male or female, and we can extend that. There is no Methodist or Presbyterian. There is no Baptist or Catholic or Orthodox. Everyone who professes Jesus Christ belongs at the same table. Everyone who professes Jesus Christ is a righteous one in him, not a sinner like the Gentiles. In my mind, nothing is more important to a 21st century Reformation than recovering this vision of the church and recognizing that Paul's gospel is all bound up with the proclamation of a new type of community, a new type of Israel, an Israel in which these divisions of the old world have been dissolved. But Paul goes on. 